Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. I spent my first year of ministry in Bulgaria. It was my assignment from the seminary. My wife and I were idealists. That first year, we threw ourselves completely into learning the language and the culture of the people that we were serving. We dressed like Bulgarians. We ate like Bulgarians. We rode public transportation like Bulgarians, didn't have a vehicle, didn't have a television either. After a while, one of our colleagues took us aside and said, you know, you don't have to be martyrs. Well, we kind of liked that name, and we named our first cat Muchi for the Bulgarian word for martyr. We did experience some real persecution. The word martyr comes from a Greek word which means witness. But in modern day usage, it has been associated with somebody who suffers and even dies for the sake of their religious convictions. We had a lot of fun and had a lot of great experiences during our time in Bulgaria. Overall, It was a very positive time for our life. It was nothing quite as special as the first ministry experience that you have in your career. But we did experience a little bit of martyrdom, real martyrdom, or maybe I should use the word persecution, towards the end of our stay there, nine years later. For about four months, at the end of my stay in Bulgaria, I went through the torture of not knowing whether I was coming or going. It all had to do with politics and my visa. The local leadership of the church forced me out of the country. I received no support from the people that I had spent years mentoring. To say the least, it was one of the most painful times of my life. It was painful because my wife and I had made such a deep dive into the local culture. The detox coming out of Bulgaria lasted for about two years, and including the first six months of that time in which I had regular nightmares about what I had been going through. I couldn't even look at Cyrillic letters for a decade afterwards without invoking bad feelings. Uh, Our mission board chairman at the time, who was a former missionary from Africa, told us a story about the first missionaries to Africa way back in the 1800s. He said that when those first missionaries came to preach to the cannibals, the the local people tied them up and threw them into a pot to see if they were sincere about their message of loving the enemy. I don't know that his words were very comforting to my wife and I at the time, but there is some truth to what he was saying. There's a movie and a book called The End of the Spear about a group of missionaries who were working with an indigenous tribe in the Amazonian jungle of Ecuador and literally met their end by a spear on the sand of the river bank. But what's interesting is that their wives and children moved in with that community of native Ecuadorians and over time this violent tribe which never had any inhabitants reach the age of 40, eventually became converted to the Christian religion and had people who actually died of old age rather than dying at the end of a spear. 
Now, there are lots of missionary stories that I've heard over the years, stories about how local people have worked to expel the bad missionary, in other words, the missionary that they perceived was blocking their access to funds or influence uh, from the host organization. Uh, I've heard stories about missionaries that have been uh, robbed, home burglaries, tied up, beaten up, or kidnapped, held for ransom. And even though I don't know any missionaries who personally have died as a result of their activities, we know that that is also something that continues to take place today, as it did in the first century. But you don't just experience persecution from the people that you're trying to evangelize. The people who are closest to you create pain as well, whether they do it consciously or not. During the nine years that I lived overseas in Bulgaria, every conversation I had with my father ended with him asking this question. So, when are you coming home? And that created some pain for me. It's not just missionaries living overseas that experience persecution. Pastors in the United States are also a target. Pastors take quite a bit of heat at times from disgruntled members. Members that uh, take offense because the pastor didn't thank them publicly for their voluntarily given service, or who take offense because the pastor never visited their sick mother while she was in the hospital. Of course, because of HIPAA laws, you can't always find out who's in the hospital. Some pastors take a lot of heat from angry members that don't like the direction that the pastor is taking the congregation, especially if there's some substantial change involved. And those members can put up roadblocks, all kinds, spread false rumors about their pastor, and even try to force him out. Why do missionaries and pastors put up with this? Let me share with you a reading from the book of Acts, chapter 8. It's about the persecution of the early Christian church. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. When the going gets tough, the gospel gets going. Uh, that's my takeaway from this reading from Acts chapter 8 and the persecution of the church throughout the centuries. Think about these Christians who were forced out of their homes. In many cases, their family members had been imprisoned and even put to death. They didn't complain about the inconvenience. It's interesting, wherever they went, whatever new cities they ended in, obviously were different from the place that they had left. And obviously there were some pretty significant cultural differences uh, back then, even in the ancient Roman Empire, but they didn't allow those things to stop them from reaching across the cultural divide with the gospel. Those early Christians certainly didn't wring their hands and say, we can't do anything. No, instead, they fulfilled Christ's promise that the gospel would spread in Judea, Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. And as a famous church historian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Let's talk a little bit about what martyrdom is and what it is not. Martyrdom, or suffering persecution, is not about saving others. There's no guarantee that whatever abuse that I endure 
will have the effect of bringing another human being to a good place, to the saving faith in Christ. Yes, actions do speak more loudly than words, but ultimately it is only the gospel of Christ's forgiveness that will turn any dead-in-sin unbeliever into a living, breathing child of God. Enduring persecution isn't about saving yourself. Now, the Christian religion does not say that martyrdom, in other words, that dying in the name for the sake of the Christian church, it's not a guarantee of paradise. Salvation is won through Christ's death, not mine. My willingness to endure hardship and persecution in the line of the gospel is not about me proving myself or proving to other people that I am a hero, that I am worthy uh, to take my place alongside the other missionaries in the heavenly hall of fame. There should be no room for that in my thinking because finally we're all just flesh and blood, even those Christians that faced the lion's in the Colosseum back in the first and second centuries. They were human beings just like me. Finally, it's it's all about Jesus and his willingness to endure punishment, isn't it? I mean, Jesus, you we know the story of what he suffered, the punishment that he endured, the humiliation that he received from human beings, and, and ultimately the punishment that his heavenly father heaped on him on the cross. My suffering certainly can't add anything to that. His suffering was complete. He paid for every last sin of every human being in the world. And he saved everybody, right? I, it's not my suffering or my willingness to endure persecution that's going to save anybody. It's about Jesus and what he endured. And I think it's also important for any Christian, to, but especially Christians who are suffering, to remember that Jesus will continue to spread his kingdom throughout the world until his return in glory. And he'll do that with or without me. Why do I then endure persecution? Sometimes I endure persecution because it's my own fault, right? I I, I know I'm not perfect. I can look back at the things that have happened to me over the years, even my exit from Eastern Europe, and I, I can see how I had I bear some complicity in that matter. I also suffer because, well, that's the nature of being Christ's servants, right? Jesus said to his disciples, if this is how they treat the teacher, how do you expect them to treat the students? If you are out there in front leading people to the truth, to the light, well, you can expect that the Prince of Darkness is going to be following you every step of the way, trying to make your life miserable because he doesn't want anybody to be saved. And I also endure persecution willingly because of Christ's promises. He promises to be with me as I give witness not only with, does he promise to give me the words to say, words which may save my life and save the lives of the people that I'm talking to, but he also promises to protect me from harm. I also endure persecution because I know that sooner or later I am going to leave this world. And ultimately Jesus knows exactly under what circumstances that's going to happen. I can't prevent my own death, but I can trust that my death will be for the glory of God. And I was burned big time by the men that I mentored in Bulgaria. For a long time, I was bitter about how they ran me out of the country. Now, I didn't want to speak the Bulgarian language. I didn't want to eat Bulgarian food or th Think about 10 years of my life for a long time. What helped me move past this attitude 
was that I forgave the people who had done me so wrong. I felt sorry for them, that the devil had confused their minds to the extent that they saw a friend as their enemy. And as I stated earlier, I also acknowledged my own complicity in my downfall. And so today, I want to be a part of the solution, not the problem. Instead of complaining about the poor treatment I receive from others, I want to examine what I can do. And so today and every day, with God's help, I will interact in a positive way with my fellow human beings. I will not assume off the bat that everyone just wants to get into my pocket or they want to get rid of me. I will remember that I need Christ's forgiveness just as much as everyone else does. That's why I want to follow his example of self-sacrifice, patience, and love. And with his help, I will bridge whatever gaps exist to bring that peace to others. And I'll remember that persecution helped the early church grow by leaps and bounds 2,000 years ago. And if God pushes me outside of my comfort zone today, I trust that he will use this experience to grow me, to grow my family, to grow my fellow missionaries, to grow the leaders and the members of the local churches, and to grow his kingdom. Now, next time on Home Ties, you know what buyer's regret is, right? It's the feeling you get once you sign the paperwork on buying a house that you're making a mistake and that you should have bought a house in a different neighborhood or you should have bought this house for a lot less money. Second-guessing yourself is common especially when you're making big life decisions. But it's a significant theological question. Whether your life's path is predetermined by God, nothing happens by accident, right? Or is it all your responsibility to make the right choices? So you better find a sign from God. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.